Hi everybody, my name is Davis and I love 15 minute walks on the beach. Any longer than that and I start to get pretty bored. Ding, 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 class is in session. That's right, we're going back to PragerU, everybody's favorite university that is definitely a real university. After my last video dissecting a PragerU video, I got some of my first ever hate comments, which is a big deal for little old 129 subscriber me. I'm gonna be sad if my videos ever actually take off because making jokes about how few subscribers I have is really fun. Hopefully by then to make up for the loss of such great jokes, I will have enough money to afford like triples of the Barracuda or something. Triples makes it safe. Triples is best. The PragerU lesson we will be taking today is on the importance of being scared of anything you don't understand. To quote Dennis Prager himself, if I'm confused by it, I'm scared. If I'm scared of it, it must be evil. And if it is evil, God can kill it. So let's get right into it. The Mona Lisa, the Pietà, the girl with a pearl earring. For a score of centuries, artists enriched Western society with their works of astonishing beauty. The Night Watch, The Thinker, The Rocky Mountains, now I know when he says that he means this painting of the Rocky Mountains by Bierstadt, but I like to imagine that he was talking about the actual real life Rocky Mountains, like from IRL. Master after master, from Leonardo to Rembrandt to Bierstadt, produced works that inspired, uplifted, and deepened us. Ah uh, yes, the old inspired, uplifted, and deepened. Classical art always gets that IUD right up in there. And they did this by demanding of themselves the highest standards of excellence improving upon the work of each previous generation of masters and continuing to aspire to the highest quality attainable. But something happened on the way to the 20th century. Now in a second he's gonna go on about how something happened that made art more abstract and hard to understand, but he never actually explains what that something was. I have the answer though. It was the invention of the human camera. The camera, a revolutionary new invention that allows the user to finally take a picture, it'll last longer. The invention of the camera did not make the realistic paintings that this guy is drooling over obsolete, but it certainly made them no longer necessary. Like before the invention of the camera, the only way you could look at something realistic while you weren't there there is a painting of it. Like if you ever wanted to know what your sister looked like before she got destroyed by dysentery, you better hope she had a friend who had an Adobe subscription or an iPad Pro or something. But after the invention of the camera, you could just hit a button and there was a picture that would exist long, long after she would. It was a miracle of modern science. So keep in mind while he's talking about this stuff that every time he says like, the world has gone downhill, people don't respect realistic stuff anymore, morality has gone down the toilet. Just remember that no, people just started creating things that cameras couldn't. The profound, the inspiring, and the beautiful were replaced by the new, the different, and the ugly. Oh yeah, as if nobody before the 20th century painted anything new or different or ugly. <laughs> Today, the silly, the pointless, and the purely offensive are held up as the best of modern art. He says pointless here, but what he really means is, I don't like it. If he just said that, if he just said, I don't like these, that would be fine. Then this video would not be controversial at all. Like, it'd be kind of stupid, but fine. Like a dog rubbing its zone all over your carpet. It's kind of cringe, but relatively unobtrusive. But instead of just voicing his opinion, he had to use such objective language, and now he's just actually wrong. Like, he's kind of claiming that, like, Giacometti's walking man is pointless. He's saying Brancusi's The Kiss is pointless. And he's saying that this drawing I did in third grade is pointless, just because it came out after a certain time period. All three of those are equally incorrect. Also, I'm not sure what's up with this four boxes thing. Like, why did he just write purely in the bottom right one? I think what it is is he wrote offensive in the same blue that the background is there, but I, I don't know. That seems like really bad graphic design, but this guy claims to know what he's talking about, so I'm just gonna trust him. Maybe I'm just not smart enough. Oh well. Michelangelo carved his David out of a rock. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art just offers us a rock. No, no, he's right about this one, actually. Michelangelo carved David out of a rock, and Michael Heiser didn't, which means all modern art is bad. Look, dude, you can just say you don't understand it. It's okay to not understand things. A rock. All 340 tons of it. That's how far standards have fallen. Quick note on just like the writing of this video. The way you phrase that last part makes it sound like standards have fallen 340 tons, which doesn't mean anything. I know what you meant, and I know you uploaded this video like 45 years ago, but you might want to take that one back to the drawing board, just make your point a little more clear. How did this happen? How did the thousand-year ascent towards artistic perfection and excellence die out? It didn't. Ooh, how I wish you would just stop that sentence right there. But alas, he does not. It was pushed out. Beginning in the late 19th century, a group dubbed the Impressionists rebelled against the French Academy de Beaux-Arts and its demand for classical standards. 
Whatever their intentions, the new modernists sowed the seeds of aesthetic relativism, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder mentality. Today, everybody loves the Impressionists. And as with most revolutions, the first generation or so produced work of genuine merit. Monet, Renoir, and Degas still maintained elements of disciplined design and execution. But with each new generation, standards declined until there were no standards. All that was left was personal expression. So this guy's telling me he'd rather look at a painting of a realistic rock than a painting that, like, expresses how it feels to be human. Don't get me wrong, I love a cool rock as much, if not way more, than the next guy. But if I had a choice between a cool rock and a real human connection, I would choose the human connection every time. Me making this video is actually kind of an example of that. This PragerU video, this stupid, incorrect PragerU video, is technically, when it comes down to it, a personal expression. This Robert guy is expressing his confusion and fear over stuff he doesn't understand, and I'm choosing to make a video in response to that instead of making a video in response to a cool rock. Now that I've said it out loud, I don't know if that example made any sense, but basically what I mean, never mind, just pretend you understood what I meant. I do appreciate this helpful graph though, these numbers are very accurate. Let's check out some of the art that came out the year we reached zero actually. The weird conservative attitude of it's not the same as it used to be so it must be worse is one of the saddest points of view I've ever seen in my life. Like every time somebody has an opinion that mirrors that, they're always missing out on so much good stuff. There's so much new awesome stuff coming out constantly. This guy is like the Gen 1-er of art history. Pikachu, Bulbasaur, Geodude. For a score of years, Nintendo enriched millennial society with their pocket monsters of astonishing epicness. Charmander, Mewtwo, Missing No. Champion after champion, from blue to red to Ketchum, trained Pokemon that burned, paralyzed, and poisoned us. But then this Chikorita asshole started Pokemon's descent into hedonism and perversion. The great art historian Jacob Rosenberg wrote that quality in art is not merely a matter of personal opinion, but to a high degree objectively traceable. But the idea of a universal standard of quality in art is now usually met with strong resistance, if not open ridicule. Yeah, all right, deal. I'll meet that idea with open ridicule right now. A universal standard of quality about something as subjective as art is not only dumb, it's plain old incorrect. And I don't even have to prove it. He actually proves it himself in the same sentence that he proposes the idea. The mere fact that anybody disagrees with his opinion immediately proves that the standard of quality is not universal. Here, I'll prove it again because I'm really feeling myself right now. You know that big stupid rock he roasted earlier? I love it. I think it's such a cool work of art. Walk underneath that thing and tell me you don't feel the size and weight of that massive solid object seemingly magically floating above you. It's extremely cool. I love it. And he doesn't. Proving that there's no such thing as a universal standard of quality. Shut up, Robert. I looked up your art, by the way, and it's really beautiful. I wish you were nicer, though. Keep up the good work as far as the art goes. I want to give you a chance to respond, though, so I'm going to challenge you with a question, Robert. How can art be objectively measured? How can art be objectively measured? I'm challenged. In responding, I simply point to the artistic results produced by universal standards compared to what is produced by relativism. The former gave the world the birth of Venus and the dying Gaul, while the latter has given us the Holy Virgin Mary, fashioned with cow dung and pornographic images, and Petra, the prize-winning sculpture of a policewoman squatting and urinating, complete with a puddle of synthetic urine. Without aesthetic standards, we have no way to determine quality or inferiority. Love that you picked two that were kind of gross as an obvious ploy for like shock value, as if every modern art piece is about piss and shit. I do wonder why I didn't choose art by other modern artists though. Like why didn't he pick a piece by El Anatsui, who takes literal trash and litter from the street, often bottle caps discarded during Dennis Prager's drunken rants about how He-Man was better than She-Ra, and makes these massive beautiful tapestries out of them. Or he could have added someone to the list like Brian Krasisnik, who paints these absolutely gorgeous and genuinely heartfelt art about his ideas about angels and relationships. I've met Brian Krasisnik a few times actually, he's a super cool guy. I talked to him about ghosts for like 15 minutes one time, it was great. Or why didn't he include in his first list art like this insane thing from Hieronymus Bosch, who was alive when Birth of Venus was painted, by the way? Or this drawing of a, uh, 
which is from medieval times. Note, in case you weren't counting, medieval times were long before the 20th century fall of art. The way I phrased that last bit was a ruse. I do not wonder why he didn't include any of those things. He didn't and or did include what he did because he knows he's wrong and wishes he weren't. He also says, without aesthetic standards, we have no way to determine quality or inferiority, and that's also wrong. I actually devised my own system that flawlessly determines whether or not a piece of art is good. It's kind of a flow chart. Let me show it to you guys. I cross-reference this flowchart every single time I see any image, painting, JPEG, and it works every single time, flawlessly. Feel free to screenshot. Here's a test I give my graduate students, all talented and well-educated. Please analyze this Jackson Pollock painting and explain why it is good. It is only after they give very eloquent answers that I inform them that the painting is actually a close-up of my studio apron. I don't blame them. I would probably have done the same, since it's nearly impossible to differentiate between the two. All right, all right, he's going for a little bit of a gotcha here, and it's a nice try. But nobody who's paid more than half an Adderall's worth of attention to a Jackson Pollock painting would think that this was a real Jackson Pollock. Pollock, like him or not, has a pretty distinct style. Here, let me do my own test. I'll show you three Jackson Pollock paintings so you can get to know him a bit, and then I'll show you three pictures in a second, and you will tell me which one is a Pollock and which two are not. So with these three, notice the color choices, the directions and the sizes of the paint and shapes. Got it? Cool. Okay, now I'm gonna show you two images of paint splatters I found on Google and one more Pollock. Not just kidding, here are the real three. Now, which one is the real Pollock? The correct answer is painting B. Leave a comment below if you got it right or wrong, and if you want, what your thought process was for deciding. Also leave a comment about your favorite thing to splatter. And who will determine quality is another challenge I'm given. If we are to be intellectually honest, we all know of situations where professional expertise is acknowledged and depended upon. Take figure skating in the Olympics, where artistic excellence is judged by experts in the field. Surely we would flinch at the contestant who indiscriminately threw himself across the ice and demanded that his routine be accepted as being as worthy of value as that of the most disciplined skater. I don't even want to address this analogy. It's so stupid. It, this is not how art works, and he knows it. I know that when I say this, people are going to think of Maurizio Catalan's The Comedian, you know, that stupid banana tape to a wall. A banana tape to a wall sounds a lot like a guy walking in and demanding that his routine be accepted. But here's the thing. It was. It was absolutely accepted. This guy ran into a random room, taped a banana to the wall, and it was accepted two times by two different people who bought this piece for over 120 thousand dollars. That sounds pretty accepted to me. Audiences loved it too. People paid to go see it. People talked about it. People laughed at it. Made people wonder what art really is. My grandparents who wouldn't know a Picasso from a pit crew were talking about how they would define art at Sunday dinner that week. Like it or not, the banana taped to a wall had a very loud and very profound effect on us as a society. Some people might also bring up Duchamp's The Fountain and oh boy, I got another video coming about that one, so hold your horses. Not only has the quality of art diminished, but also the subject matter has gone from the transcendent to the trashy. Where once artists applied their talents to scenes of substance and integrity from history, literature, religion, mythology, etc., many of today's artists merely use their art to make statements, often for nothing more than shock value. Artists of the past also made statements at times, but never at the expense of the visual excellence of their work. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I have two points to make with this, with what he just said, and I'm not sure which to do first, so let's just start with Goya. Goya is one of my favorite artists of all time. Check out this piece called The 3rd of May, painted in 1808, before the 20th century. It shows a man about to be shot by a firing squad. With this piece, Goya sought to commemorate Spanish resistance to Napoleon's armies during the occupation of 1808 in the Peninsular War. This piece is not pretty, it's kind of messy, disproportionate, awkwardly shaped, and pretty upsetting to look at, but that's the goal. Goya, at the expense of the visual excellence of his work, made a statement about the horrifying and messy violence of that war which killed many people he knew and cared about. Also, anyone who's anyone knows about this piece. 
If visual excellence died in the 20th century, how do you explain this, Robert? Art didn't used to be realistic and beautiful, and now it's not. Art has always been a lot of things. It's always been sometimes beautiful, sometimes terrifying, sometimes bad, sometimes awesome, sometimes epic, and sometimes cringe. Just like anything and everything that humans do. Art has always been an attempt by humans to capture something they couldn't capture any other way. Art is the master ball, and the human experience is a Rayquaza. The other thing I want to say is that this second painting he showed, The Death of Marat by Jacques Louis David is an interesting choice. Robert here is saying that artists used to make statements without sacrificing visual excellence, but this painting is kind of sacrificing truth and historical accuracy to the false god of visual excellence. See, Marat here had a debilitating skin disease, theorized to have been a uh, dermatitis herpetiformis which caused him to develop like blisters and red splotches all over his skin. The bath he's in in this painting is actually a medicinal bath that he used to treat this disease. But if you look closely at this painting, hmm, how curious. This guy's got skin like an airbrushed eggshell. So yes, obviously this painting is beautiful, full of visual excellence, no denying that. But it's also a lie. The problem obviously isn't that it's not realistic. I like a lot of art that's unrealistic to the point of not even being comprehensible. The problem is that this painting is intentionally covering up a very important aspect of the truth. And I'm not saying that we should go cancel Jacques-Louis David for being ableist or something, but I am saying that when it comes to depictions of historical events like this one, I value truth over beauty. It's not only artists who are at fault. It is equally the fault of the so-called art community, the museum heads, gallery owners, and the critics. Yeah, Robert, okay, let's tear down the elites, down with the system. Who encourage and financially enable the production of this rubbish. It is they who champion graffiti and call it genius promote the scatological and call it meaningful. It is they who, in reality, are the naked emperors of art. For who else would spend $10 million on a rock and think it is art? Oh, never mind. He hates the elites because he wants less art. I hate the elites because I want more art. More, more, more. I want as much human expression as I can get. I want a never-ending scroll of Instagram and Tumblr and Twitter artists just drawing whatever their heart desires. I want Sonic OCs. I want goofy fan art. I want a painting of a PB&J. I want it all. But why do we have to be victims of all this bad taste? We don't. By the art we patronize at museums or purchase at galleries, we can make our opinions not only known, but felt. Yeah, as if I could afford anything from a gallery. In case you forgot, Robert, I have literally 129 subscribers. I can't exactly afford triples of the Van Gogh. An art gallery, after all, is a business like any other. If the product doesn't sell, it won't be made. I am less passionate about this point, but it is also not true. Like, I'm spending hours writing and editing and researching for these videos, and I haven't made a single dollar from it yet. I'm just doing it because it's fun, and I like having a final product to look at. Nobody has bought or even considered buying a single sentence from the Bionicle Paraka Roommate AU I wrote when I was 10. You know what, maybe I am a bit more passionate about this point than I thought. I get that galleries are a business, and I get that selling art is a business. But if your entire artistic process is based on how much money you're going to make instead of how much you care about the artwork, that is extremely sad to me. Me. Sure, it's nice to make money, of course. Just ask Mojang as they rack up my hard-earned $7 a month while I sit here waiting for my friends to actually want to hang out in a Minecraft server for one. But the thing that's different about art from other forms of work is that while working at a gas station for four years has earned me infinitely more money than art ever has, art is an expression of things that I've felt and thought that I can't really communicate using human words. It's a vehicle through which I can communicate with people who are looking at my art, and we can form a connection with each other in a way that you can't really form a connection by just talking. The way Robert talks about art, it feels like he just wants all art to be a comfortable, complacent viewing experience. He wants to look at art and know exactly what to expect and walk away unchanged. In the words of Gnarly from Smiling Friends, Kinda cringe. We can also support organizations like the Art Renewal Center that work to restore objective standards to the art world. And we can advocate the teaching of classical art appreciation in our schools. Okay, come on, dude. Classical art is literally the only thing being taught in most classes. What we need are more classes about art that isn't from like Central and Western Europe and like one tiny era in Japan. I love all the classical artists even more than I like cool rocks, but like there's so much more out there. I had an art history professor in college, Professor Duque, and she developed a class specifically for this purpose. It was about like Mayan art and African art, and art from all sorts of places that you don't normally talk about in a classical art history class. And it was really awesome. I learned so much. Aboriginal art, Native American art. It was really amazing. I could talk about how cool she was forever, but this video is for telling Robert that he's a sucker. Let's celebrate what we know is good and ignore what we know is not. By the way, 
The white background you see behind me is not simply a white graphic backdrop. It is a pure white painting by noted artist Robert Rauschenberg at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. I'm Robert Florzak for Prager University. Oh, roasted. Wow. Never heard anyone say that boring paintings like this are bad. Wow. Oh, my kid could do it. Mm, good one. Robert, you really do hate the new and different because all of your roasts of modern art are getting so old that they're starting to actually care about what the hell a 401k is. I have a lot to say to roast this take, but instead I'll just recommend this Jacob Geller video that explains it way better than I ever could. I'll also show you these two comics. What I'm trying to say here is that art isn't worse than it used to be. All the art that used to exist still exists, and there's way, way more art now. So how could it be worse? It's better, if anything. Especially these days with how easy and accessible it is to make art and publish art. We see art from women and anyone other than rich French people these days that we never would have seen 200 years ago. And we can, if we want, see hundreds if not thousands of beautiful pieces of art every single day. If you're following a bunch of artists on social media, you're consuming more art per day than any pre-20th century mutton-eating peasant can consumed in their entire life. I can go online right now and see a beautiful landscape, an intimate portrait, and a heart-wrenching depiction of true love within 30 seconds if I want to. So long story short, I think that artists these days rule, and Robert thinks that artists these days suck. Which is weird because he's an artist these days, but whatever. So that's too bad. Hopefully you guys out there are able to see more beauty in the world than he's allowing himself to. There's a lot of it out there. My challenge for you guys this week is to go make some art that would make Dennis Prager pee himself. Shouldn't be that hard. He's kind of a coward. Bye.